and we were playing Ireland. So I said to my twin brother, you just look for Drico. First crumb, like he looks to the ball inside. When he turns around, Drico was under the post. Take him out, I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> the media, let me stop telling him. All the week, the standards he drives and uh, in a team, they're unbelievable. If I have to pick, give me all day Johnny Sexton. Uh, we need to get that detail properly because if you focus on that detail and you keep that passion, then you make passion a, a point of difference. Welcome to the next episode of the Rugby Pod Beyond Expected series, presented by Asahi Super Dry, official beer of Rugby World Cup 2023. In this series, we'll be talking to legends of the game as they tell stories from their career, the unexpected moments on the pitch, the surprising connections, friendships and post-match beers shared off the pitch. We're joined today by Argentina's all-time leading point scorer, a World Rugby Hall of Famer who played a key role in securing the Pumas' third-place finish at the Rugby World Cup in 07 and will be hoping to play a key part in helping steer Michael Checker's Argentina to Rugby World Cup glory in France this year. Pumas legend Felipe Contempomi joins us. Felipe, how are you, mate? Thank you for inviting me. Great to have you on, mate. I know we've uh, had a few games against each other over time. More importantly... You're in Portugal. I'm on holiday in Portugal. You're on a training camp with Argentina. How are you? Where are you? Get me in the squad. <laughs> well, it's top secret. No, no, seriously. <laughs> we, are, we are in uh, probably a, a place where uh, many teams came before, like Browns. It's called in, in Villa Mora. Yeah. Um, yeah, we, had, we, we are here um, two weeks. Uh, we have a game against Spain, you know, in the, in the middle um, next Friday. Uh, and then we, we head off to France, straight into France, you know, just it's the last the last few bits of uh, before the World Cup. Is it all a closed shop so that I can't come down and watch training or because I'm English and it's a bit awkward now, isn't it? Um, well, I need to check with checks. <laughs> <laughs> well, Felipe, if you follow Goody's social media, he's not English. He doesn't like the English team anymore. <laughs> but how are things, Felipe? Obviously, a World Cup on the horizon in France, Argentina, deep history in the World Cup. You're now back coaching. Just kind of set the scene of the energy for you personally being back involved. Yeah, well, it, it's been, uh, to be honest, um, I was having a, a great time in Leinster. You know, I, it was very hard to leave Leinster because um, top, top institution, top club to be in, great players, uh, great staff. Uh, I've been very lucky, but you know how it is when when... The opportunity came to go back home after the pandemic. I've got two daughters living in Argentina. And then uh, with my wife, we said, go back. And, you know, it was, it was the right time. Probably there were a few things going up and coaching the national team. So, yeah, it, it, it's been so good. It, it's been really good so far. But, um, yeah, now it's, and also with the prospect of, of a World Cup just around the corner. You know? So, um, it was a great opportunity and yeah, I'm enjoying every minute. And how tough was it for the Argentinian players? Because there wasn't a lot of games going on over COVID and, you know, there's the one competition they're in. The players are spread around the world as well in different leagues. The issue with the Jaguares as well. It, it must be really tough, but it's the sort of thing that brings you closer being Argentinian and that band of brothers spirit that you've got. Yeah, it, it's a challenge. And, and you know, there's no perfect world. So... You, as much as as long as you know the challenges you're facing, then it's trying to make the best plan uh, with what you've got, you know. And I know the challenge is having everyone in different clubs, different uh, around the world, or most of them in Europe. Um, so then it's it's about just planning. Planning is a big part on us, and and I think we had a good plan, especially in this. Sometimes it's very hard when you have players playing the the club rugby in, in the Northern Hemisphere and international rugby in the Southern Hemisphere because suddenly it becomes a 12-month competition for them. And we speak a lot about um, welfare for the players, but then we don't do that much, you know. And when do they rest? When do they have a pre-season? When do they work out? Like, So we had a plan of giving them three weeks rest. doesn't matter when they finish. 
um, if they finish early with their club or if they got to the final of the top 14, everyone got three weeks off and then three weeks of, of training before they can play their first game for us. And obviously that it was difficult or a challenge with some players that finished and played the top 14 final uh, end of, of or middle of June and they could only play against South Africa. But well, I think it's, it's, it's the right thing to do, you know, for them and in the long term and short and long term for us as well. You know. With all of the dynamics with the Argentina team, it's very different compared to any other nation because the players are scattered all over the place. As a coach, what would be the dream scenario internationally? You obviously play in the championship. Like, how would you like to? I know it's going off on a tangent because we've got the World Cup, but just we might not get you again. Well, maybe have a, 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 a top quality professional competition in Argentina with all the players and foreigners players coming and and making a better. But but that won't happen, you know. So we, it's like a dream if we talk like that. What, what realistically, what we could have, yes, it's, it's in, a, in a way having uh, more players involved in a team or maybe two teams in, in, in good competitions. It could be Super Rugby, it could be uh, URC, it could be uh, in Europe or somewhere, but having more of a control of the schedule of the players so that we can give them proper rest, proper precision, proper development and um, rather than always trying to deal with clubs and and you know it, it's all all the points of view are understandable because everyone they put the money they want to get the best out of, or the most out of the players we want the, the most out of our players so to represent Argentina in a proper way but the one that I think it's losing all the time is the player himself, you know. And does it help? Obviously, you've experienced it yourself playing abroad, obviously played at Bristol, played at Leinster, obviously wanting to go back and play for Argentina. Michael Checker understands it better than anyone else being an Australian sort of background coach. And, um, you know, he understands having coached in Leinster and all different places as well. Does that help the players to understand that you two have lived that experience yourselves and understand it from that perspective? Yeah, yes, definitely. But but also for them, you know, they are at the end of the day, they are Argentine. One thing that is um, uh, that I really praise is that the Argentinians we love playing for our country. It's something I don't know why uh, there are other uh, countries that they are the same. You know, I I, I lived and, and coached and played in Ireland and I can feel that the Irish people are more or less the same. They are very proud of playing for their country. So our players, they always want to come and play for our country. But obviously they want also uh, uh, to be able to play in a very good competition like Premiership or Top 14 or URC or, you know, so it's understandable. And we, you know, it's, as I said, it's a challenge and we have to try to get the best out of that challenge and not just fight with clubs or just get to the best outcome for the players, you know. Yeah, and with that then, and we've had Sir Bill Beaumont, we've had Gus Pichot on here, who are the, I say influencers, but now working at World Rugby, I know it's slightly different that the influence is more widespread than that. What is Gus Pichot saying about it all? What's his opinion on it? What would he come in? Would he come in and, and give you a league in Argentina? Is that what he's proposing? No, well, I'm a good friend of him, but um, when we, because of a very intense life that we lived, uh, we we don't pass too much time together. We talk every now and then, and when we talk every now and then, we probably talk more of uh, personal issues and family, and rather than too much rugby. But I think that uh, yeah, Gus. Um, I think Gus genuinely wants uh, rugby to be a, a, a world world recognized sport. You know, like be broader and not just a few nations or tier one nations. And having said all, what, all the challenges we have, I think that there are other countries like say Fiji, Samoa, uh, Tonga, that they have even bigger challenges than us. So in one way, we could be, um, have less resources than some other countries, but we have more than others as well. You know, you're, we are in the middle, but if we want really to have a, a very competitive uh, and, and 
rugby to be played all over the world. Um, it has to be more uh, popular or more like even, if you want to say it in one way. And that's the difficult thing because when you start going worldwide and trying to join all the world in one place, uh, it's it's a long way, you know. <laughs> yeah. Um, but but I think there the I think what I I've seen in the last. Um, 10, 15 years is that rugby is heading towards there. Obviously, there are different opinions, different and, and welcome all the opinions, you know, but I think everyone's trying to work towards making rugby a more even or more broad uh, game, you know. You mentioned your good friend there, Gus Pichot. I mean, go- growing up, he was always one of the greatest players to watch. You got to First hand look at that. What was he like to play with, and and also what what was he like off the field as well? Because he's a pretty big personality, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah. He's he's very generous with with a, with a, with his friends. Like he'll be very uh, a, a team first uh, player, you know. But at the same time, a very um, strong personality, as as you said, and he's a leader and so on. Playing with him as a ten. Uh, it's a nightmare. No, <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, it's, he goes so quick that it's very hard to to follow. You know, um, he was very quick in decision making. So I really enjoyed because I like to play a, a quick, fast game. So I really enjoyed playing with with him, um, and I'd say we made a, a good partnership all together. Um, outside outside the pitch. Uh, he goes as quick as as inside the pitch. He's very he's all over the like. It's very hard to. I, I'm. I find it. I struggle to follow him outside the pitch. Inside the pitch, yes. Outside the pitch, I'm more calm. I want to stay focused in one thing. He he's all over in ma- in too many things, and it's admirable the way he does it because he's he really has a lot of time for a lot of businesses, you know. So. Um, yeah, it's it's a it's a brilliant brain, um, but definitely he goes too quick sometimes for to follow. You know. Yeah, good stuff. He's uh, he's a brilliant bloke. We've had him on the podcast, and he's making big waves in trying to change the game. But what really stood out for me, you go back to two thousand seven and that World Cup in France, when and we're in a similar position now, aren't we? We're going to a World Cup in France, but you guys had the the pleasure and the privilege of beating the hosts um, on that group stage uh, it was an unbelievable game um what was the feeling like going into that competition because that's when to me and a lot of people around the world and i'm not doing argentina a disservice but that's when people everyone started looking at argentina and going this is one hell of a team with some unbelievable players and it took the world stage to make that happen a bit as well didn't it yeah it did. well th- third time lucky because we had uh, the previous two world cups we played the inaugurational game and we were pumped by the local teams you know wales <laughs> and australia but uh, yeah, we, we knew it was a difficult task and probably because we've been there, uh, you know, the, the, the first game in a World Cup, it's always a party for the host country. Um, and we knew it was, we were the outsiders. But at the same time, we had a lot of players playing in France, uh, a lot of players playing in England, playing against French teams. We've beaten France before. Uh, many times, you know, in Marseille in, two, in Marseille in 2004, that they they say it was their fortress and so on. So we were confident, like, uh, and I think the good thing in that World Cup is that we prepared accordingly to the occasion. You know, we were we went to uh, the States to Pensacola. We did a very good fitness preparation. Um, we had some good experience and and players that we played together for a long time and also uh, very good young players coming through like uh, Leguizamon, Juan Fernandez Love, Hernandez. So we kind of had a, a good blend there. So we felt confident going into that game. And once you win the first game and, um, and uh, you know, you're, you started the competition with the right foot you're in a different, like, it, it all goes smoothly or smoothly, you know. Uh, uh, so, yeah, it was a great occasion and we still remember it. You 
know. Yeah, I remember it for different reasons, Felipe, as we move through. I remember we beat Italy in the last game to qualify for the quarters in France. It was like we won the World Cup final and then we faced you in the quarterfinals. And I just remember it was the uh, maybe the emergence of Juan Martin Hernandez, the most beautiful man to have played rugby. But yeah, yeah, he looks great now. I saw him the other week, actually, at the World Rugby thing in Paris and he's 40 years old he, he looks amazing but you've got history in World Cups I know Scotland have I don't want to bring Scotland and me into this Philippe but Argentina have got history in World Cups right as in you get the timing right I know you've not won it but no one's really talking about with you at the minute with all due respect but what is it about World Cups um yeah it's funny the way how people see you from sometimes when they see you from abroad from outside you see yourself different. And it's true that we've been, in the last few World Cups, we've been uh, maybe sometimes overachieving, but um, I find it that, for example, that World Cup, for us, it was a huge, big occasion that a quarterfinal, because we've never been there. And, and um, I think, actually, we were lucky that day when we beat Scotland, because we probably Scotland was better that day or oh, we it was an even game but um we just i don't know how we we didn't probably was our worst game of the world cup that one and we we went through we were kind of lucky but when you come to new occasions then a semi-final say in, in um when we played uh, south africa it was not only new the semi-final but it was kind of we weren't used to play south africa every year or as it's happening now. So I think that now Argentina is much better prepared to go into a World Cup. If we get to any of those occasions, I think we we are much better prepared in terms of knowing what we can, uh, wh where we are going, you know, like playing. It's not, we, we've been in New Zealand twice in the last uh, three years that We've never beaten them before. So for us, it's like now for these guys, it's like, okay, we've done it once, twice. You can do it again, you know? So it's, it's, it becomes different, the challenge. Um, and hopefully, yeah, I know, I don't know what's with Argentina in the World Cups, uh, but maybe it's that we, we have the luxury of being three, four months together and that help us to, to cohesion and, uh, preparing and, and, and all the Argentinian teams that did well in World Cups, they really enjoyed their time together. Uh, so, yeah, that's definitely the Argentinian way to enjoy time together and drink the mate and all that stuff, right? I can see you've got yeah. some there. <laughs> they all love it. Um, what was your favorite ever memory from a World Cup? Then, obviously, you've played in a few. I've got one that I'm going to pick up in a minute about another game against Scotland. But, um, for your favorite memory, that Paris one would be hard to get away from, right? either the opening game or potentially the third place game or the semi-final? Yeah, yeah. I, 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 sometimes, um, I sometimes say that um, I've been very lucky because um, I had the, the luxury to play three World Cups with my twin brother. And for me, for me that's the, the, the pinnacle of, of rugby, you know, of, of my rugby career. Because you normally play in a national team, you play with the best players, but playing with maybe your best friend and even your twin brother and three World Cups, it's very unusual. We naturalize a situation that is not very natural or very common. Um, and for me, that was the pinnacle. I, I still see or remember, even after the last game we played for the third, fourth place, um, going around the stadium and, and it came natural and, and very um, like normal that we went together and, and I still watch it. And, and it wasn't made up. It just was, we wanted to go together in a big hug and we went around the, the stadium together. So for me, those are the, the moments that um, being able to have three World Cups with my twin brother was definitely the, the pinnacle. And, and as you said, probably France 07 was the best of, of all the World Cups, you know. Well, you're talking to two fathers of twins here. So Jim's got twins, I've got twins. Do, are you still mates? Because my two always fight. I can't work it out. Uh, well, <laughs> wait till they are. I think we, we also always fight. There's a very good uh, um, story 
we were playing Ireland that World Cup 07. And for the first time, I've never played, uh, uh, in, we were playing 12 and 13 with my twin brother, but I played 12 in attack and 13 in defense. And we were playing Ireland and we knew that, uh, I knew them by heart, the, the Irish backline because Dar, Strico, I played with them. So I said to my twin brother, you just look for Drico and you follow him and I will cover all what's outside of him. Don't worry, but you just follow him. Don't take the eye of him. First crumb, like he looks to the ball inside. When he turns around, Drico was under the post. I turn around <laughs> and I say, new F word, like giving out, like really, really hard to him. like. And like, I remember uh, the vice captain Longo came to under the sticks and said, Felipe, calm down. He needs to still play the game. Fuck, take him out. I don't care. <laughs> it's the media. We've been talking, telling him all the week, just look for Trico. Don't worry about the address. Just follow him, follow him under the sticks. So, uh, yeah. So we still fight in the big moments. We still fight. But, but then you pick each other because you know by heart what's coming on, you know. Felipe, the power of sport in Argentina. We saw the scenes with Messi, the World Cup. I just want to reference Maradona. I know that he was a fan, the great late Maradona, Diego Maradona. Uh, like, how was that relationship with him and the team? Look, um, as I said, you know, we are very uh, proud of playing for Argentina and it's not an ex exception rugby. It's in every sport, they're very proud and, and the big sport people, they always support the other Argentinian teams like Maradona is a big example, but then you have Messi, Ginobili, they always support all the other teams. Uh, Maradona was, it's not that was a rugby fan, he was an Argentinian fan. So he will support and he came a few times to, to the rugby, uh, rugby games. He came in 09 in River Plate, he came to Vélez Safiel, um, and he always comes down to the dressing room and uh, he's a, he was a very... Um, a charming guy when you meet him, you know. Now, for me, it's very, um, it's very subjective what I'm going to say because I grew up watching him winning the World Cup 86, you know. For me, it was the only sport hero. He made a lot of errors in life or, or what I think they were errors in life, but I never judge him for outside the pitch. It's like, for me, I always wanted to keep them, remember him, playing soccer, you know, what he did in, with Argentina in Naples. Um, uh, so, um, yeah, it's a tough one, but it was my only sport hero to say it in one word. So luckily I only met him two or three times and in a dressing room in a sport environment. So I still keep that uh, uh, fantasy or, you know, making him the greatest ever. And well, now I think Messi, I'll put him beside him or even a bit higher, you know. <laughs> oh, hang on. Say it again. Felipe, say it again. Say it one last time because this could blow up. Beside him? Uh -huh. Not higher. Messi or Maradona? You think Messi's in front now? Well, look, I always say we the Argentinians and maybe everyone, but I always say why we have to compare or people, we, we need to be lucky that we have two of the best ever players in the world, you know. I'll say both, you know, I'd say we have the two best ever. Okay, Brazilians will argue Pele, Georgie Best, um, you know, there are some other very good ones, but why, why compare them? Just be joyful that we had two of the greatest, you know? Very different lives, very different lifestyles, you could say. Yeah, diff yeah but also very different eras as well, you know? Um, today, like, a professional uh, footballer he, it, it, with all the social media and everything, it's, it's completely different. I always said beforehand, like for them to make money, they have to go to a place. Now they have to stay at home and just send a message and they'll make money. So Maradona was taken into the wolf hunt, you know, like it, it was, he, you take him into a nightclub and you know, there are a lot of, Footballers now they can't go to a nightclub because first of all the fitness they don't doesn't allow them to go. They need to keep up to to pace and 
And second, because it's why would they go if they can, you know, they make the money by twitching or I don't know, Instagramming something, you know? Yeah, 100%. I, I'm no fashion, I, I have no social network, so. <laughs> well, while we're talking about Messi and Maradona, we're building a Camp I 15 for this World Cup. Um, we are asking people for three players that you'd like to share a beer with, either players you might have played with or against. I mean, if you want to put Maradona and Messi in there and give us a story behind it, I'm sure that would be okay, wouldn't it, lads? Two very different nights. <laughs> yes, completely. <laughs> if it's for the night, probably you'd pick Maradona. But, <laughs> but may, I don't know, for a football game, yeah, both. Yeah. No, I think, look, um, players, have, it would be very unfair to pick only three, you know. Uh, I've been so lucky with, with the amount of players I've played with. Um, and against, um, I've been very, very lucky in, in, in Leinster, in Toulon, in Paris, uh, then internationally. And I made good friends around the, uh, so obviously I had uh, my Argentinian mates that I would, you know, like Roncero, Ledesma, Pichot, uh, Fernandez Love, Nacho, and uh, my twin brother. I, I would go with loads of them. Uh, and I still meet them, so I'm not going to pick them. But um, but uh, I'd say, you know, I'm a good friend of Gordon Darcy, Drico, Chaggy, uh, the Irish guys. From international that I play with, uh, George Smith, I'll definitely invite him. I'll go for beer. He's, he's a top guy and so sound. Um, Johnny Wilkinson, Johnny Sexton, both I played. And um, yeah. DC, I haven't played, I played against, but I, 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 I had a, a few beers as well, uh, Dan Carter. And yeah, I've been lucky, I'd say. You, you played with some legends, right? Obviously, you were a legend yourself in your own right, but you just list off those guys that you played with in Toulon and Johnny Wilkinson and Johnny Sexton at, at Leinster. Um, you're looking at Johnny Sexton now and Ireland, and obviously you're going to hopefully come across them maybe in the semi-finals, something like that. Um, what's he like as a character? Because I actually love the guy and he does get a bit of flack in the, in the press around how he is, but he's a genuine guy. He loves a, a bit of red wine or a beer and uh, off the field as well. You know the psyche of him though. He, he's the ultimate competitor and someone that is going to hopefully for Irish people lead them all the way to the trophy. Look, I, I think that, um, I'm not saying that Ireland is where they are because of him, but he's a big part of that because the standards he drives and uh, in a team, they're unbelievable. He's a natural competitor. Um, and obviously, uh, we can argue the forms and sometimes he could say something or so on, but no one is perfect, you know. And if I have to pick, give me all day Johnny Sexton because he's a competitor and you know you'll, you'll be there. Um, and, and what's for me... And maybe here I'm not that objective because I love him as a, as a person. It's like, and I know him well. Um, he's he always trying to do the right thing. It's not he's not a guy making any shortcuts. He's not a, a a guy cheating. He's he's just a very passionate and competitive guy, and that's the way he expresses them, and that's the way he he can get. But you see, Owen Farrell, that's it's very similar. And, you know, they're two of the greatest in this era. So um, give them all day long. I, I would take them every day. Yeah, absolutely. And talking of passion, you've got a few in your team as well. Marcus Kremer, just to name one. Him and Eben like a bit of grabbing, isn't it? But the passion, the Latino spirit, that's something that I always recognise playing against you. But going into this World Cup specifically, how important is it to get that balance with that and obviously having the, the state of mind to kind of suppress that passion? Yeah, well, I don't want to suppress that passion. I want to, you said it, balance it properly. You know, I think sometimes Latinos, we are very passionate and, and you can uh, make the passion a, a strength or it can become a, a weakness. You know, if you over, if you go over the, the limit or if you get that passion, you get over passion. You need to understand that I think Sometimes the Latinos, we think that it's all about passion. And for me, it's the balance of passion and excellence. You know, doing the right thing at the highest level, 
consistently all the time. So uh, we need to get that detail properly because if you focus on that detail and you keep that passion, then you make passion a, a point of difference. But if you only trust on your passion and only uh, like trying to be a, uh, like gutsy guy, like, yeah, it will take you to a certain limit and then you go over and it will become a weakness. So we need to balance that. You, you said it perfectly. And I think we are in the right track. You know, we are trying, it, it's more like trying for them to focus that it's not all about only passion. It's more about excellence as well and getting the right balance. If you were my coach, Felipe, back in the day, if you were my coach, I could have been so much greater because I was just over passionate. That's what I'm going to say. That's being kind. I could have been greater as well because I was <laughs> over passionate as well, I think. <laughs> That's what I was going to say. Do some of the lads pull out some of your clips from when you played when you're talking to them about a calm head because you were a fiery character as well, which brought the best out of you? Yes, but I think because I, I when I was a player, maybe I... Um, I didn't have the right balance, you know, and and I think you learned, you know, and, and I would have loved someone to get me when I was a player and said, look, mate, play with the same passion, but bring this, you know, you need to balance this at certain time and so on. And that's what I think I believe. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. But Johnny, Johnny, we had this discussion with Johnny Sexton because he's a very passionate guy. And so you need to balance it at a certain point. And, you know, there's no right or wrong, but I don't want to take that passion of anyone because passion could be a, a strength and, and a, a point of difference. You know, you need that to go the extra meter, but you need to also have the, the, the right balance of excellence, you know, making the right thing consistently, uh, you know. So, yeah, that's where I think... I've learned a bit, hopefully, I'd like to think, and, and I try to transmit that. Felipe, you mentioned extra meter and you mentioned going back through footage. I've done both of them. And there's a clip that I've got on my phone, Felipe, 2011 in Wellington, Argentina versus Scotland. I think you're about 10 meters offside. Dan Pouts <laughs> goes for the drop goal. <laughs> on 77 minutes, you are 10 meters offside, force him onto his left foot and he spoons it. And I'm thinking penalty. Barnsley, Wayne Barnes, penalty. Any thoughts on that? Any views? He's held please? this grudge for a long time now, Felipe. He's held it for a long time. <laughs> Not with you, with Barnsley. <laughs> I went frame by frame, and I think the scrum half had the ball in the hands and already lifted when I get, got out. I, no, I think I agree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it was yeah, it was very very tight. I I, I remember that game. Uh, yeah, after what I got really. Completely nuts was with uh, Gonzalez Amorosino after scoring a great try. He did that knock on from the, from the restart that gave you the chance to have that drop goal. Uh, but yeah, I don't know. Let's keep it like that. It's sometimes <laughs> the, the doubt of the benefit <laughs> or benefit of the doubt. Yeah. In my mind, that was our first chance to win a World Cup. So um, <laughs> it's fine, Philip. I just thought I'd ask. And you say you think, and I say I know. That's you, You're dreaming, Jim. Go. You're dreaming, Jim. He, he was onside. <laughs> he's, he's cleared it up for us. Well, let's talk about the World Cup that's just literally a couple of weeks away, Philippe. Opening game. I'm English. I'm, pr I'm a proud Englishman that are desperate to see an England victory. But that opening game against England is massive because it will set the tone for both yourselves and us where do you see England at the minute? It's very hard to look at them and say, this is how they're playing from an English perspective. But you guys know that they're probably keeping stuff up their sleeve for the World Cup and they're going to improve, right? Yeah, definitely. I think England is England and coming to World Cups, you know, at the end of the day, it's the only Northern Hemisphere that won a World Cup. And that's, you need to respect history. They'll come with that. And, and I think, look, um, they, have the, the, they have very good players. It's just sometimes it takes a moment of eureka moment to click, you know, and maybe it haven't arrived, it didn't arrive yet, but it will arrive, hopefully after our game and not before. But, uh, but, but definitely we are expecting a very tough game. We are expecting a, a very tough English game. Uh, you know, England for the last few years has been playing very English game with a lot of powerful possession territory, 
uh, set piece and well we know that and and we are preparing accordingly you know it will be a tough game but having said that um we are confident that we'll prepare ourselves to to prepare to win um now I, i'm not saying we will win but we'll we'll be well prepared and that's that's the main that's what we can control our preparation and we are doing all what we can to to get in the best form we can for that game and for the following uh, for the for the ones that follow as well you know? and looking at your squad like often argentina chucks up i mean we've talked about hernandez back in 2007 and cordero as well like, looking ahead at your squad for this tournament are there any potential Argentinian heroes that we should be keeping our eye on? Are there any guys that are going to burst onto the scene and make a name for themselves? Oh, I can't say I'm the coach, you know. I can't say... Uh, <laughs> Who's your favourite? <laughs> no, no, never say your favourite. <laughs> Look, I treat... I always say I treat everyone differently because they are different, they are persons, but I care for... or or I, I value everyone the same, you know. I value... All, all players the same. There are some good players, some young players that they are um, coming there to the right uh, moment. I, obviously, I can name you the the. For me, Julian Montoya is a it, it's it's a leader. He's our captain. He's it's a guy that's been playing brilliantly the last few years, and and it's a bare standard for for us, you know. But then. Yeah, you have Kramer, but everyone knows those. But there are some young players like, uh, well, that you've seen probably uh, Gonza- Juan Gonzalez, uh, Cinti. Uh, they are coming really nice. Um, for me, uh, Santiago Carreras, uh, very good. Uh, they, and they are only 22, 23, 24 years old. You know, they are very young uh, footballers, but with a lot of quality. And the, the biggest question for them or the biggest challenge for them is just play their best rugby at the biggest stage. That is a World Cup. You know, it's not easy, but, um, well, you know, hopefully they can do it. Yeah. And then just looking at the lay of the land, Felipe, obviously Ireland number one, host nations, France, New Zealand coming good, South Africa look very, very strong when it's coming to business time. Is there anyone else that we're not talking about, do you think, in that mix as a coach that you've identified thinking they're coming strong now? Look, I've always been very, very um, fan of the Fijian rugby. Fijian rugby. And and I think, even watching them yesterday, and, and I think they are very well coached. They have very good players. It's just a matter of clicking. And if they can keep that, again, that discipline of uh, the, I think they could be a very very strong team you know um, especially you know maybe they are in a pool where Australia is finding their way we'll see how they get their very young team selected for Australia uh, Wales and um, also with a change of coaches with Warren coming back but you know also a young team and this Fijian team they have a lot of experience you know you see Ravadra and so many good players there that um, they could be a very interesting team, I think. With Railuni, uh, like, you know, the coach is a very good coach. Um, he he's Fijian, understands the culture. I'm I'm sure he can get the best out of those players. And if you get the best out of those players, well, you know, you have Walter, you're so many good players there. Yeah. So you don't want to play Fiji in the quarterfinals then, no? Uh, give me anyone in the quarterfinal. You have to beat everyone to be world champion. You know, I don't care who. We need to get there first. You know, if we get to the quarterfinals, I, I don't. Any any team will be tough and will be prepared if we get there. But uh, yeah, no, it's not. I'll play Fiji in the quarterfinal. Like it's. Uh, but but you ask me, whom do I see that could be a, a, a surprise coming out of the. Fiji is, is one that uh, it's been impressing me for the quality of players, how good they are and, and how well coached they are, you know. You mentioned coaching. Can you give us an insight into Michael Chica and what it's like working with him and how much of an advantage he gives you guys going into a World Cup? Look, I had um, uh, I had the privilege that he was my coach in Leinster and then in uh, Stade Francais. Um, when I was 
invited or by him called to, to come and coach in Argentina and so on. Um, I said, okay, but um, I, I, I was like, I said, I, I love you as a coach. I never worked with you as a coach. And I think we've got the best version of Michael at the moment. We are, we're seeing the best. He's, because coming back to that passion that we say, he's a very passionate guy. guy very, very passionate guy. For an Anglo-Saxon or Australian guy, that even he's Australian, but he's a very passionate guy that always works into the emotions and so on. And he brought to us, but, but nowadays he's like much more calm in, in a way of he, all the experience of 25 years coaching and so on. He's bringing all that experience into our camp, you know, and so he's, he's been brilliant in changing or um, developing the mentality of, of the players, of the Argentinian guys and going back to what we said of um, keeping the passion but bringing excellence, he's been brilliant. So I think we, uh, I, I would say, you know, like all the good wines, the, the older they are, the better. Like uh, we are getting the best version of, of Michael, you know, I think, or oh, that's my perception. Good stuff. Good stuff. Legend, Felipe. It's class to have you, mate. Felipe, thank you so much for coming on, mate. Really appreciate it. And obviously, best of luck for the World Cup. Go get them. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. Good luck just after after the first week. Not the first week. I don't wish you good luck in the first <laughs> week, just after that. Well, hopefully we'll see you around there. Take uh, care. Yeah. Good Take care, Jim.